the king made an image to be worshiped. And he said, everybody, when you hear the music, worship that image. Well, there were some Jews who wouldn't break the second commandment. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, where we are discovering some interesting things about these people who would not break the second commandment. We're going to talk about that in about five minutes. Right now, Corey is here with Ryan. Corey. I'm going to be taking a look at the chief god of Babylon. Ryan. Well, lots can be said about the book of Daniel, but today I'm going to be focusing on chapters two through seven because they're designed and arranged in a specific pattern known as reverse symmetry, also called a chiasm. A very interesting. Janice? I know that Esther's watching today and she's going to be answering this question along with Bob and Cindy and Greg and oh my goodness, Marinette and Sinclair. There's so many of you. It's anywhere from Ezekiel 34 to Daniel 4 is our Friday wrap up question. Daniel 3, 1 through 15. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was sixty cubits, and its width six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, harp and lyre in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 through 15.
Daniel chapter three and four. I love the book of Daniel. It's great. You know, the Ten Commandments are really the key moral laws of God that he put in front of Israel. They are first recorded in Exodus chapter 20. And for today's reading assignment, I would like to highlight Exodus chapter 20, 3 and 4, when God spoke to Moses saying, quote, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image in any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Now that's interesting. That's something we have to pay attention to because of those who hate me, he says, but showing mercy to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Close quote. Now the passage was deeply embedded into Jewish hearts of Hananiah. Meshael and Azariah, who had been renamed with the Babylonian names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is the beginning of their testimony. Only the beginning, let me tell you. And it is fascinating. As we begin to read this, I want to tell you that if you don't have the Bible guide, why not? Write for yours today. Call or write. And, uh, or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the page. It'll take you there and you can download it exactly like it is. Today, two, two chapters here, really. And we're going to focus on uh, one chapter. Three is the image of the gold uh, that he lines up. And uh, also Daniel's friends disobey the king. <laughs> Saved by a fiery trial, Nebuchadnezzar's praise to God. This is really interesting. And chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. So we have dreams happening here. So, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that we would see you today and hear what you're saying. As we are excited about this, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand that you do the same thing today. You have not, you don't change from yesterday. You don't change today and you don't change tomorrow. You're the same, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said together, amen. All right. You ready for this? Here we go. Daniel chapter 3, verses 1 to 6 says this. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, what did he do? Broke the second commandment. He made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and width was 60 cubits or six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony, with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Wow. The king made an image of gold for all to worship, a direct violation of God's law that he had given to Israel. Now, let me say this. Social media moves us in the wrong direction. If all we do is follow it. Did you hear that? Follow social media. Let me tell you something. I, I only go on social media. I'm very limited. Quickly, on the prayer meeting, I don't stay on it. I read 
some specific things, but I don't stay on it because, oh my goodness, it is everywhere. And I've just had to do that. We follow it. Wait a minute. That becomes like a God. We follow it. We care what other people think about us. But what does God think? What does the Lord say? What does the Lord think? That's important. Really important. Chapter 3, verse 7 goes, So that at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the symphony, with all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. And they spoke and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Well, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the provinces of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image, which you have set up. The Chaldeans found a way to trap Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There are some in the world who look to trap believers and turn them away from God. I want to tell you, if you haven't figured that out, my question would be, do people know you're a Christian? You got a target on your back. When you're saved, you got a target on your back. The good news is that target can't get to that target because God protects you. So beloved, keep that in mind. Let's read on because this is the beginning of their testimony. Daniel 3, 13 to 15. Then Nebuchadnezzar in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they brought these men before the king and Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear it, the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? The king became furious and tried to force the men to bow. Beloved, as Christians, we must work to become leaders in this world. <laughs> and let me tell you something. This world needs help. And we need people who love the Lord to step into leadership. Because when you do that, you know the rest of the story. If you don't read the Bible, read the rest of it. But the rest of the story is fascinating. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not only lived, but succeeded at this. Because we must pay attention to the Lord and follow his lead. Because we need to lead, we don't need to follow. This character of King Saul, this historical figure. Now, I think it's probably fair to say that most of us, uh, when we think of King Saul, we think of the bad guy foil to King David. But an entire book of the Bible is also dedicated to mostly his reign. Of course, that's 1 Samuel. So I'm really excited to jump into it today and see what we can learn about Saul. Today, I wanted to take a look at Babylon's religious views, specifically as they related to Marduk or Bel, the chief god of Babylon. Because covered in our reading today, in Daniel chapter 4, we see a reversal of authority that Nebuchadnezzar has to go through. He goes through this humbling process and where he has to admit essentially that he is not a god himself. Why would he be thinking maybe that he was? Well, let's take a look and see what we can learn. Due to Israel's interaction with Babylon, and specifically with the Neo-Babylonian Empire of Nebuchadnezzar II, there are many references to this nation and its practices in the Bible. 
In the biblical books of the prophets, the religious system of Babylon is often called out to be in direct opposition to biblical beliefs. This was particularly concerning as many former citizens of Israel and Judah had been removed from their land as exiles and lived in Babylon with and under this system of worship. Connected to this exile imagery, the prophet Isaiah, living before the Babylonian exile but still in a time when Babylon's chief god Marduk was widely worshipped, makes the claim that one day Marduk's idol would be carried off into exile with its people. The history of Marduk is an interesting one. His main cult center was the city of Babylon at the great ziggurat and adjacent dedicated temple. This ziggurat and temple faced a series of destructions, rebuilding, and renovations throughout the many ages of its existence. But the most famous reconstruction occurred under the watchful eye of Nebuchadnezzar II, the great builder king of Babylon who also was responsible for the destruction of the Jerusalem temple and who appears as a main figure in the biblical book of Daniel. During this time, Babylon's temple and ziggurat experienced a type of golden age, when its former glory was perhaps even surpassed by the extravagance of Nebuchadnezzar's renovations. Nebuchadnezzar could then claim to be a truly dedicated monarch and take up his place at the yearly festival held for Marduk, when the king would take the idol by the hand and lead it through the streets of Babylon to another temple, where all would bring their offerings and worship. The worship of Marduk goes so far back into the history of the city of Babylon that his origins become murky, but his association with and as the patron god of Babylon are likely original. It's believed that as the city of Babylon gained political power and domination over other cities and territories, that the power of Marduk also grew, beginning to absorb other gods and their powers and realms into his own. As Marduk absorbed other gods in popular belief, their names became descriptive names for his many attributes, until eventually Marduk could even just be referred to as Bel, meaning Lord. By the time of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar II, Marduk was king over all the gods and the savior of humanity. These roles had been described in the even now famous Enuma Elish and another poem. Marduk was believed to be strong enough to rule over all other gods and to be personally interested in helping the fate of humanity, which adds a very sobering context for Nebuchadnezzar's confession of Israel's God as recorded in the book of Daniel. So when we read Daniel chapter 4 in the light of who Marduk was and of what Nebuchadnezzar specifically did for the worship of Marduk and, and even yearly, uh, perhaps even to the day of his death, what he would have had to do in order to worship Marduk and keep you know, the, the structures of Babylon going. It really puts Daniel chapter four in a very interesting light and it makes a lot of sense why this would be a very humiliating thing for this king of Babylon. Very good, excellent, Corey. Ryan? All right, well, today my segment spans Daniel chapters two through seven because there's something here I really don't want us to miss. As if there aren't already enough amazing features in Daniel, these six chapters are arranged in a specific pattern known as reverse symmetry, also called a chiasm. Now, I have done a couple of segments in the past on this particular literary device, which is used quite frequently in the Bible. And you can watch or read those reports on our website or you can watch them on my YouTube channel, which is just my name. But today I wanna to focus on these chapters in Daniel because that's where we are in our Bible reading. So let's go. Despite the fact that the Bible is a collection of 66 books penned by some 40 authors over a great span of time and space and in three different languages, it reads as if it's only one book by one author. Indeed, each individual book builds upon the last, progressively revealing God's plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. This unity of theme is one of the greatest hallmarks that the Bible is what it claims to be, God's word and personal revelation to us. Another hallmark of its divine inspiration is its high literary form. 
Though one might expect much of the Bible's literary style to be quite primitive, since many of its contributors were mere shepherds, farmers, and fishermen, God's Word is instead a literary masterpiece, even employing several literary devices. Some of these devices include alternation, immediate repetition, parallel symmetry, and reverse symmetry. Probably the most fascinating of these devices is reverse symmetry, also known as a chiasm. A chiasm is an intentional literary device in which a sequence of ideas is repeated in reverse order, mirroring the original sequence in order to focus attention and highlight the center of the chiasm. Items in a chiasm are parallel, working toward the central point. Such repetition also serves as an important memory aid. Chiastic structures are prevalent throughout the Bible, and while some are limited to just a few verses, others span several chapters. In the book of Daniel, for example, there is a giant chiasm spanning chapters 2 through 7. In chapter 2 of Daniel, world empires are symbolized by four medals of a statue. In Daniel 3, three young men are delivered from the fiery furnace. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled. In Daniel 5, Belshazzar is humbled. In Daniel 6, Daniel is delivered from the lion's den. And in Daniel 7, world empires are symbolized by four wild beasts. This chiastic structure clearly reveals the central point of these chapters, which is God's humbling of the prideful. But this particular chiasm also answers another question regarding the interpretation of chapters 2 and 7. As Dr. Mark Hitchcock notes, the chiastic structure reveals that Daniel 2 and 7 cover the same ground, employing different images for the same empires. Daniel 2 presents the four world empires from man's perspective as a great metallic man, while Daniel 7 views the same empires from God's perspective as wild, ravenous beasts. This is an important key for Bible scholars and students who wish to properly identify these four world powers. So then, far from being a primitive collection of writings, the Bible shows a level of literary form that suggests it's more than just merely the work of fishermen, farmers, and shepherds. So as you can see, the chiastic patterns are employed as a teaching tool. For one thing, they often reveal the central theme of the text, but they can sometimes also help us with interpretive challenges as it has here. Daniel chapters 2 and 7 cover the same ground. The nations in chapter 2 are the same as in chapter 7. And as I also mentioned in the segment, chiasms are also helpful for memory aid. Now, as I said earlier, you can watch the other segments I've done on chiasms on my YouTube channel, which is just my name, Ryan Hembry, and they're also posted on our website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. As a matter of fact, I've already posted today's segment online as well, and there are lots of our other videos and articles there as well. So. Please read, watch, and share them with others because we really want to reach as many people as we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, we do. And uh, Ryan, in case people don't get that, Bible Discovery TV. Bible Discovery TV. Remember the TV. That's very important. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And uh, that's the website where you'll find all kinds of things to watch and read and everything else. So it's all about the Bible. And we do that. Corey? You and your husband do a wrap up. What's going on? Yeah, we do a chapter by chapter recap every week. So the idea is just we know that there's a lot of assigned reading every week and it's really easy to fall behind, but it's not as easy to get caught back up. You know, you get a few days under your belt. That's quite a few chapters. So we do a chapter by chapter recap on YouTube with the idea being it's about half an hour. It gets you caught up on the entire week's reading so that you can just start fresh the next day. So if you want to check that out, it's just my name on YouTube, Corey Babechko. All right, Corey Babechko and on YouTube. That's yeah. excellent. Very good. Look for that. Janice, we have a mm -hmm. question today. We do. And I know Carol's watching too, by the way. Hello, Carol. Yep. Good to she see you watching. She answers questions all the time. Very good, very good. All <laughs> right, so this was today anywhere from Ezekiel chapter 34 to Daniel 4, which is a week's worth of reading. So here it goes in a vision. God took Ezekiel into the land of Israel. It's a long question. Okay. And he saw a man there with a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand. How did Ezekiel describe this man's appearance? Let me read it again, because we've got lots of time. 
in a vision, God took Ezekiel into the land of Israel, and he saw a man there with a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand. How did Ezekiel describe this man's appearance? Was it like the appearance of bronze? Was it like the appearance of gold? Was it like the appearance of light? What was the appearance of this man that had a uh, measuring rod and a line of flax in his hand? What do you think? What you know do what? you think you know, we, we, and we what do you do, think? We should do like a Christian Jeopardy. Like <laughs> <awesome. laughs> this is excellent. So anyway, what do you think? Okay, we have discussed it and mm -hmm. we think, mm -hmm. we think Number one, bronze. Bronze, so, yeah. yeah. We're pretty confident. Contestant one and two mm -hmm. are going with bronze. Yes. All right. I agree. All right. You agree? Okay. Well, I don't know what all of you thought and what answer you chose, but here is the question again, because we have to do dramatic pause, right? In a vision, God took Ezekiel into the land of Israel, and he saw a man there with a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand. How did Ezekiel describe this man's appearance? Like the appearance of bronze, like the appearance of gold, or like the appearance of light? Well, here's Ezekiel 40, verse three. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. So if you guess bronze, bravo. We need to pray today and we need to say, Lord, I need to change and follow you instead of following everybody else and as somebody else. I want to follow you, Lord. I want to know what you said. I want to read your Bible. I want to understand your, your books. I want to understand what you said, the 66 books by 40 authors over 1500 years, all with the same thing. So help me, Lord. This is what I pray today. In Jesus' name, help me and help everybody who's praying with me, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.